wir, die ein ganzes Leben einsam gehen, mit heißem Herzen beiseite stehen, während die anderen den Becher der Freude leeren, wir müssen entbehren. Wir tragen die Last in Menschenleben, dürfen nicht nehmen, nur geben, warten immer vor verschlossenen Türen, dürfen nicht leben und würden geboren, tragen weiter geduldig. Warum? Schicksal, du bleibst uns die Antwort schuldig. Das dritte Geschlecht von Greta Schönrock, Februar 1931. When I catch up with old friends who I haven't seen in a while, they usually ask how my transition has been going, and I never really know what to say. I mean, I could say I got bottom surgery, I had a vaginoplasty, I started hormone therapy, I changed my voice, my name, my gender marker. I could describe all of these things that I've done in my transition, but none of them seem to really summarize how I've actually been, how it's felt to exist within a society that requires a certain input and output. How it feels to change positions within a system that was not built for trans and non-binary people, but instead was made to contain them. But it's also been beautiful and euphoric, so I usually just say that and make a joke about my sex change or whatever. Aber ich glaube nicht, dass das reicht. On June 30th, 1919, the film Anders als die Andern was released. It's about a gay love story between a violinist and one of his students, which becomes complicated after someone repeatedly blackmails the violinist. The movie centers around paragraph 175, a law that prohibited consensual sex between men. And the tragic ending showed the cruelty of such a law in an unjust society, and that, combined with the film's portrayal of homosexuality as a natural thing, represented a relatively new type of public acceptance of gay people in the Weimar Republic. At one point, the violinist Paul meets with the sexologist, who reassures him that not only is there nothing wrong with him, but he can still make valuable contributions to humanity as a homosexual. My personal favorite part of this movie is when Paul attends a lecture given by the sexologist, who says that nature is boundless in its creations. Between all opposites, there are transitions, and this is true of the sexes. When looking at a quote like this, it's important to understand the context of the time. Concepts of what we now call gender identity and sexuality were sometimes conflated. Homosexuality was often explained as being a third sex, which was influenced by a theory about a female soul in a male body, and vice versa for lesbians. Transness was also a whole other thing, and though there were depictions of gender nonconformity, it wasn't talked about like non-binary is today. But regardless, I think this declaration of fluidity as something inherent in nature is beautiful, and when contextualized within queer culture of the time, it holds a particular power. And a lot of that culture happened near here. This plaque is right near where the Institut für Sexualwissenschaft once stood. It was the place founded by Magnus Hirschfeld, the sexologist who's not only regarded as the father of modern trans medicine, but he was also a huge advocate for describing what we now label as queerness being a natural thing. And he was a sexologist in Anders als die Andern. And the institute stood in Berlin's Tiergarten, an important place in the city's queer history. Berlin is one of those cities that many people refer to as a queer utopia. And honestly, there's a lot of truth to that. People come from all over the world to Berlin to be themselves and live unapologetically. And that's definitely what it was like for me. I mean, I came to Berlin for the first time almost 10 years ago when I was 19. And it was the first time that I truly felt at home in a city and that I could really be myself. And so it makes sense that I would eventually immigrate here and build a life for myself. And when I think about all of that, when I think about all that the city has given me, all the opportunities I've had to reinvent myself and live my life in so many different ways, I just feel so grateful. But Berlin's reputation is often romanticized, both with regards to its queer history and also its current day politics. I love Berlin. It's my favorite place to be. But I want to show you the Berlin that I know, the Berlin that me and my friends live in, and the reality of being a trans person in Germany today.
is 8.40 a.m. on Saturday, February 10th. I'm currently in a hospital bed in Munich, Germany. My voice is still fucked up. Um, I recently just had my second procedure for bottom surgery in Germany. It's usually done in two parts, and for my second procedure, I had a few like aesthetic corrections and some functional things corrected and now I'm here for a few days in the hospital and honestly I I feel a bit overwhelmed I am very worried that I have another infection and I hopefully will be out of here in a few days but I don't really know what will happen next and to be honest um I can't shave right now I'm kind of a bit stressed about it I mean I could shave but I'm also I just had so many infections after the first operation that I'm kind of just like I don't know I want to avoid any sort of like potential cuts or anything that could invite infection in so I am just sort of allowing myself to like detransition almost it feels like for a few days until I am out but it is a very weird feeling to go to the bathroom and look in the mirror and see my body going in a different direction than I am trying to pull it in and it definitely makes me wonder about how much horror I'm willing to um, withstand to get to a happy ending or like be where I want to be but I think I think that's just honestly part of this process I think that is just part of the sort of trade-off of um, molding yourself into who you want to be or something almost a month since I got out of the hospital and I still have a lot of healing to do but I've learned to view the aftercare as a blessing the many rituals that helped me reaffirm to myself a type of love that I didn't think was possible to feel in one's own body but thankfully the second operation was not as intense as the first one I often tell people that sometimes this recovery has felt like a movie that's rapidly changing genre at times it's been a romantic comedy with John being the absolute sweetest and then a coming of age story with me finally seeing a distant shimmer, a new life I was finally getting closer to. But then the tone would suddenly shift, and I was in a horror movie. Pain, infection, uncertainty, it was scary. And those constant mood shifts were pretty common in the first few months. And while I was going through all of that, I thought about Dora Richter, the first trans woman to get a vaginoplasty at Hirschfeld's clinic in 1931. I sometimes felt alone at the hospital, but I never really was. I mean, I was surrounded by experienced medical professionals and was always one phone call away from speaking with someone I knew who already went through this experience. And if I was ever curious about anything, there was an abundance of experiences, photos, and reviews online. But Dora didn't have any of that. Even the medical professionals helping her, putting faith in her, were also experiencing their first time. I can only imagine what that must have felt like. There's often a romanticization of this era in trans history, like it was an inspiring time where doctors were helping trans people out of the goodness of their hearts. Don't get me wrong, there was goodness in it and it was revolutionary, but it was also desperate. In a world without much viable treatment for gender dysphoria, some people's actions matched their desperation. Hirschfeld and his colleagues taking these people's desperation seriously was the change that built the foundation of modern trans healthcare. And Dora was desperate. Before she had her archaeectomy in 1922, she told Hirschfeld that she was ready to end her life if she didn't receive the treatment. And by that point, she had already attempted to remove her penis when she was six years old growing up in the Czech Republic. Later moving to Berlin and being hired at the institute after she couldn't find employment gave her a new life. After the orchiectomy, she got a penectomy, and finally a vaginoplasty in 1931. Though people often think of Lily Alba as being the first person to receive the latter, it was actually Dora a few weeks earlier. Usually when speaking about historical figures, I empathize with them through their own words. I see myself in their feelings. And through what I've read from Dora, I can recognize my own experiences and feel connected to this woman I've never met. 
But unfortunately, there's still quite a bit we don't know about her. It was previously assumed that she was murdered sometime during or after the Nazis raided the Institute in 1933, but recent findings show that she legally changed her name in the Czech Republic and was still living there in 1939. We don't know exactly when or how she died. I feel blessed to live at a time when these procedures are not only safer than they've ever been, but also with far lower regret rates than other types of major operations. But even then, I empathize with Dolha's desperation. I had some health problems before my first operation that made it uncertain if I could even have it, and I was practically losing my mind, doing everything I could to make sure things went smoothly. And even though life-threatening complications are quite rare, I honestly didn't even care. To live with what I had before felt like dying. And so any horrors I would experience in trying to rectify that wouldn't feel like unnecessary consequences, but just another way to get to where I was headed before the operation. I don't think I've ever felt that desperate about anything else in my life. Recovering in Berlin has meant being acutely aware of the city's history. It's meant shopping at a supermarket in the same building that was once one of the centers of queer nightlife before fascism knocked it down. While I was stuck at home, I got back in touch with that history, rereading Hirschfeld's work and trans perspectives of the time. And when I first moved to Berlin, that was important to me. I originally started doing therapy in German because I couldn't find an English language therapist without an incredibly long waiting list. So I jumped off into the deep end of describing my most intimate thoughts in a language I wasn't fluent in. My German improved a lot, but I also found it easier to understand my experiences when I wasn't saddled with the baggage in my first language. And it was around that time that I also started reading about trans history in German. I had heard a bit about Berlin's queer history before, but something about reading trans people's thoughts from almost 100 years ago in the original language turned a light switch on in my head. Their confidence, their insistence on being themselves in a society that didn't want to acknowledge their existence made me wonder, could I do that? I was also surprised to learn about the nuances of queer history that were left out of narratives I had heard before. The Weimar Republic was an important place for queer people in the early 20th century. Anti-queer laws were not as strictly enforced as they were in countries like the US, and a good amount of modern queer vocab was influenced by German words. But even in one of the most queer-friendly cities in the world, trans and non-binary people still faced a lot of discrimination, and with political turmoil and the rise of fascism looming over, it was about to get a lot worse. Trying to fit this queer history within a strict moral binary doesn't paint an accurate picture. Magnus Hirschfeld was a revolutionary figure in queer history, being one of the founders of the first pro-LGBTQ organization and being one of the most prominent figures fighting for queer rights on top of his trans advocacy work. He was also Jewish, and at one point, Hitler labeled him as the world's most dangerous Jew. However, Hirschfeld was also a big advocate for eugenics, though he disagreed with the Nazi application of it, and despite writing about anti-racism, he also wrote some pretty racist things. And his theories on homosexuality were tied to concepts of race in ways that made homosexuality appear to be a primarily white phenomenon. And though there are right-wing conspiracy theories overstating homosexuality's relationship to Nazism, there were examples of gay people who, despite Nazism's homophobia, either became Nazis or facilitated their growth. And the gay man who owned the company publishing many queer periodicals of the time was one of the latter. Obviously, um, you have somebody who is willing to collaborate with anti-Semitism um, and somebody who is trying to argue that there's really no kind of political basis for this. Um, and then it gets worse. Later that year, in an article in a newsletter he wrote called Freundschaftsblatt that was so positive, it inspired the mainstream German paper to publish an article under the headline, The Third Gender Welcomes the Third Reich. Ratzewite claimed that the existence of homosexuals proved that Nazi leaders were not personally homophobic. Though paragraph 175 was almost repealed before the Nazis seized power, even after the war, those persecuted under the paragraph were placed back into prison by the Allied forces. Both East and West Germany would have their own unique relationships to the queer rights movement, but paragraph 175 would not be officially repealed in the West until after reunification in 1994, and changing your gender marker required sterilization until relatively recently. Queer history is often more complicated than we're comfortable admitting, but understanding these nuances is important. We can't know where we're going if we don't know where we've been. And misunderstanding this history can have some pretty grim implications. I mean, even this week while I was working on this video, a certain author decided to, um, seemingly imply a very inaccurate take on this history. And in Berlin, this history is impossible to ignore. When I walk around, I'm constantly reminded of it. 
But I also feel so grateful to read things that trans people wrote almost a hundred years ago, to reach back into the past and be reminded that being trans and learning to understand your body and gender in deeply intimate ways is not a new thing. In 1920, Kurt Schwabach and Misha Spoliansky wrote the song Das Lila Lied, often thought of as being the first queer anthem. The song is a powerful declaration of self-love and acceptance in an unjust society, and the chorus makes a reference to an important piece of queer media. <laughs> In the past, when I've told German trans people about how grateful I feel to live in Berlin as a trans woman, I've gotten side-eyed, usually because they're very aware of the discrimination that trans and non-binary people here face. But to be honest, so am I. While recovering, I've been reminded of how much politics have changed in the US since I left. And though I've definitely experienced transphobia in Germany, I view my life here in contrast to where I'm from. I feel very lucky to live in a city that feels like home and where I'm able to be myself. But I also think romanticized versions of the city's reputation ignore the reality of queer life here today. For example, if you're non-binary or intersex, your ability to receive healthcare can be affected. And even if you are a binary trans person, you might still face discrimination. I know someone who was allegedly told by a doctor that she wasn't serious about transition because she showed up to an appointment wearing jeans. And one time, while receiving a prescription for voice therapy from an ENT, I was allegedly told that my voice wasn't cute enough. As someone who accidentally transitioned to the 1920s and also as a binary trans woman, my gender expression has ultimately not affected my ability to receive healthcare. However, that can very much be a problem for anyone who doesn't fit within a gender binary or even just within antiquated gender stereotypes. And the way you are perceived and treated by others is also affected by immigration status, race, and your ability to speak German. If you don't know which types of treatment you're eligible for in Germany, you might be led astray. While I was beginning the process of transition, I was allegedly told by a psychiatrist that against international standards and policies in German healthcare, gender dysphoria was not a real thing and I simply needed to work harder to cope with the burden of being a man. And when I brought up Germany's history of trans healthcare, I was told that Hirschfeld's work was nonsense. After this experience, I read up on trans healthcare in Germany and learned how to advocate for myself in accordance with the relevant standards of care. I also discovered that there are many resources available for queer people to find doctors who actually follow the recommended guidelines. But even then, unfortunately it can be difficult to find a doctor who has availability, takes public insurance, and is trans friendly. And even if you do find one, they might be adhering to outdated or arbitrary definitions and guidelines that don't acknowledge the wide variety of trans and non-binary experiences. These attitudes go beyond healthcare though. Street harassment is definitely a thing, and one's ability to travel safely is often dependent not on the general public accepting trans people, but quote-unquote passing or blending in with cis society. And like I already mentioned, it's important to understand that this is also intersectional with race, immigration status, and language. And changing your name and gender marker in Germany is infamously difficult, and at the time of making this video, often involves degrading evaluations that allegedly might include invasive questions about sex or even a pedophile test, which is as awful as it sounds. Das hier, meine Damen und Herren, ist ein original Fragebogen mit Fragen, die Transmenschen im psychologischen Gutachten gestellt werden können. Haben Sie sexuelle Wünsche nach Personen unter 16 Jahren? Würde Sie das sexuell erregen, wenn Sie sich vorstellen, mit einem Tier Sex zu haben? Last year, I saw many English language news sources praise the upcoming self-ID law without knowing the specifics. Though this law objectively makes some things better, it also might make other things worse. Living in Berlin can be complicated, but it's still home for me and many other trans and non-binary people. And when I think about what makes this city so special, I think about its tightly knit queer community. Despite difficulties and discrimination, there are many organizations here that help the local community through things like counseling or even getting ID cards before you can legally change your name and or gender marker. While I was struggling with thoughts of if I should or shouldn't transition, learning about and watching videos of trans people who came before me showed me that it is possible to take control of your own life. And when I decided to finally take the plunge, looking to people I knew who had already traveled that path made it much easier to know where to begin. And that's where Judy comes in. How did I get to Berlin? Um, this was in 2014. My ex, 
who was my ex then as well, invited me to visit, and then the romance kickstarted again, and I followed her here. This city is not trans friendly. Yeah, Let's yeah. put it this way. If you are looking to transition and you're coming from the UK, I would recommend moving to Berlin. If you're thinking, like, are people in the streets going to treat me fairly? No. The answer is, like, realistically, no. Yeah. <laughs> like, I got street harassed twice in the same day this week. I go into restaurants and get treated differently to everybody else. Berlin is famously not a friendly city to anyone. I think also people bundle up a lot of queer experiences as the same experience. Yeah. And the experience of a trans woman is never going to be the same as, like, the experience of, like, a white cis gay man. I called Judy my trans mom because on the day I decided to transition, on the day I realized that the life I was living wasn't mine, I happened to have lunch plans with her. And what was supposed to be catching up turned into a coaching session. And since then, she's been probably the biggest influence in my transition, helping me understand what the process is like and what womanhood means to me. But her transition has also differed from mine in a few ways, and that's influenced how she's interacted with healthcare. I did have an orchiectomy. In order to access any kind of more complex trans healthcare, I needed to be like seeing a psychotherapist. Getting a psychotherapist in Berlin was incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, it required like close to six months of like seeing this therapist. I guess also kind of like concurrent with that is realizing that I wanted this surgery. The testosterone blockers I was using a, were the side effects were really, really damaging my mental health, and also, like, the idea that, like, they could stop being effective, which at one point they were. Yeah. Um, because I was trying to cut down my dose and then trying to, like, basically balancing my mental health against my testosterone levels, which is bizarre. And so the orchiectomy was basically, like, a way to get off that seesaw. I had like a really bizarre telephone conversation with someone from the health insurance, which because I don't speak German, had to be translated by my housemate. I was speaking to her, she was speaking to them, they were speaking to her, she was speaking to me, so it was already this kind of peculiar, peculiar thing. And like, basically, yeah, it's very unusual in Germany for like trans women to want an orchiectomy. Yeah. Um, they made a point of asking me if I would want a vaginoplasty in the next five years. I feel like I said no, and now they're gonna hold me to that. But also, I don't think I'm gonna want that. Also, like, I'd not really had surgery before, yeah. like any surgery. I'm really frightened about being in hospital. There's a huge amount of discrimination. In the face of discrimination, many trans and non-binary people in Berlin find comfort in the local community. And for me, speaking with others who had been through similar things helped me feel less alone when navigating some of the challenges that come with transition in Germany. When I came out to you, you helped me just understand a lot of the bureaucracy around it. And I feel like even though Berlin is a city that has a lot of very complicated issues with transphobia and stuff, I feel like what Berlin really has going for it is an incredibly strong community of trans people that mm. might not always see eye to eye, but it's always... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, don't, I don't know what you could mean. <laughs> Drama but, here, <laughs> heavens no. <laughs> but there are a lot of people who look out for each other. Yeah, I mean, like, the generosity of the community is, like, overwhelming. Judy's also an incredible artist who runs the comic series Everything is Somewhat Repaired, an intimate look at the process of her transition and how it's felt to reevaluate her relationships with her body, gender, and the world. I make this uh, comic Everything is Somewhat Repaired. It kind of like dodges a lot of the kind of like beginning, middle and end kind of narratives that trans memoir tends to have because like I don't experience transition like this. Why did I start the series? Partly because like I wanted to describe my experiences, partly because like it felt incredibly tangible. Like I think it's like the first, like I've been making art, I've been making drawings, I've been making things for a long time and it was the first time that I've made something that was kind of so immediate and yeah. so like easy to understand. But I wanted to be making it for other trans people. Yeah. Like I wanted it to be kind of like a description of like how I was doing things, how I was navigating the world. I also wanted it to be a way that I could describe my experiences to cis people so they understood trans experience. But predominantly I wanted it to be kind of like something which opened a window for somebody who needed to transition. I met Judy a few years before I transitioned when she attended a workshop I gave on queer music history. I started following her comics after that and now looking back it's clear to me how much her work influenced the slow process of me eventually coming out. 
By that point, I had considered transition, but didn't think it was for me, simply because I didn't know how to understand my feelings. I was caught up in stereotypes of what it meant to be trans, and I honestly thought that being a trans woman meant always knowing that you were a feminine soul trapped in the wrong body or something, and because I didn't feel that, I ignored the vague but persistent discomfort I had with my body that eventually boiled over into every other aspect of my life after I unsuccessfully tried to repress it. Reading Judy describe her transition not as a one-way street, but instead a complicated path of interrogating her past self and understanding her life in new ways really showed me how transition was nothing like I thought it was. And slowly, I could see my past being rewritten in real time seeing how certain memories made more sense when I viewed them not as a singular feminine soul trying to break out, but instead seeing gender as a process of elimination. And when I hit the point of knowing I had to transition, it wasn't because I knew what it felt like to be a woman, but because I had tried everything else and would never forgive myself if I didn't do the one thing I'd been trying so hard to avoid. And I felt Doha's desperation, once I admitted that, it wasn't like coming out as gay, where I felt like a weight had been lifted off of me. Instead of revealing something that I had embraced but hidden from others, I made a decision to take my life into my own hands before I was even really fully okay with it. And once I accepted how truly uncomfortable I was in myself, I wouldn't be able to forget it. So I began the slow, agonizing, beautiful, confusing, and euphoric process of transition, a process that I'm still very much in, but now understand much better than I once did. The phrase actually comes from like a comic I was making previously and then was became a song that I was making. I can't remember the exact full sentence, but it's like everything is somewhat repaired. This is how we pass through time without being forgotten. Yeah, it's about survival. It's about knowing that like nothing is going to stay pristine. Everything is going to be broken and repaired, and those repairs are going to change things. Nothing is new, and everything is like in, in change, is in flux. I can only lie down these days, hearing harmony in heat waves. Clap for my friends, say hi, then hug, then go home. Seeing other people could work out for some things But if we're seeing other people, when will you see me? I feel your death in these streets I walk I hear your voice even when I talk But you're nowhere that I can see that might feel strange, but I'm oddly relieved. I can't be everywhere, even if I want to be. It's happening to me And maybe that's all I 